Thank you to both of them. And as Christina said, um, they are not being paid. There's no com uh, commission or promotional uh, fee being paid to them. But really, it just comes from their heart. You could tell that it was an experience. So again, highly encourage you next time that we have registrations to please sign up. All right. Um, as you know, it's almost Christmas. We have one week to go. When we say, are you ready for Christmas? Oh my God, Christmas is coming. Christmas is in a week. Christmas. When we think that and say that, what are we really saying? What does it mean to prepare for Christmas? Are you ready? When I say, are you ready? Are, are you ready for Christmas, Rachel? Are, it, Christmas is next week. A Emma, like, are you ready? What is, what is that? What do you think of? Presents? What? what? Gifts? Food, some people said. Basically, when someone says to you, are you ready for Christmas? They're saying, is your shopping all done? Is that not true? That's what a lot of people, that's the meaning behind it. Are you ready for Christmas? Means, translation, is your shopping all done, right? And that's what I think we as a, a um, you know, society have really changed that to. When we think Christmas, we think, oh my gosh, the stress of gifts. Gift giving is paramount. Can I afford them? Am I going to have to fight the crowds? Is it going to be empty shelves? And, you know, just buying things. But, you know, it's not very often that December 25th falls on a Sunday. It's not very often at all. And next Sunday, it is Christmas Day, December 25th. And I'm, I don't know about you, but I'm really looking forward to spending Christmas Day with my church family, worshiping together and sharing and, and fellowshipping together with you all. I know that there are churches across the world that are canceling their Sunday service so that families can be together and not have to come out to church. I know churches are, are doing that. We're not one of them. Um, for us, again, I, I look forward to spending time with you all on Christmas Day, celebrating and worshiping together. Today is the fourth Sunday of Advent, which is traditionally associated with the theme of love. You know, there's like hope, joy, peace, and um, well, today is love. And John 3.16, very familiar passage, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but will have eternal life. John 15.13 says, greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. So we know that God loved us so much that he was willing to sacrifice his only son for us. We know that Jesus loved us so much that he willingly laid down his life for us, calling us his friends. So today I want to talk about Jesus and his many names. This is the title. It's Jesus Emmanuel. And I want to talk about the various names of Jesus, but one in particular, as you can see up there, Emmanuel. Emmanuel is spelled, you will see it with an E as well as with an I. Um, if you need to know, that it's, it means the same thing. You can, both are correct. I is because of the transliteration spelling from the Hebrew, and then the E is most commonly used because the Hebrew was translated to the Greek, the Septuagint, the LXX, and then that's been transliterated to the E to um, go along with the Greek alphabet. So that's why. Both are correct, I and E. And we're going to be looking at Isaiah 9, 6, and 7, as well as the Old Testament passage and a New Testament passage, Matthew uh, chapter 1, verses 20 to 23. Now, in Shakespeare's famous um, play, Romeo and Juliet, Juliet asks this question. What's in a name? That which we call a rose by any other name would smell as sweet. Right? This is a famous uh, quote from Romeo and Juliet. That may be true, but, and I want to go through a few things about names. First, we know that names are very important to God. Even from the very beginning of creation, we know that what was Adam's first job? To name stuff. Thank you. Good job. Be chosen, Sharp. The first job of Adam was to name stuff. Naming is very important, right? He was um, called to name all the animals. Look at Genesis 2, 
19 and 20. It says, so the man gave names to all the livestock. Now the Lord God had formed out of the ground all the wild animals and all the birds in the sky. Is this correct? Okay, and brought them to the man to see what he would name them. And whatever the man called each living creature, that was its name. So the man gave names to all the livestock, the birds in the sky, and all the wild animals. So we know that names were important. That was the first job of man. Secondly, in the Bible, we see time and time again, over again, that names often, babies and infants were named for how they related to a circumstance or some sort of aspect of how they were born, right? How they came to be. For instance, Isaac. What does the name Isaac mean? Laughter. Very good. Isaac means laughter. It's because Sarah said, quote, God has brought me laughter because she and Abraham, she felt, were too old to be with child. And so when she was told that she was going to have a child at that old age, she laughed, right? And then the baby that was born from that was called laughter, Isaac. Now, Jacob. Jacob's name can mean a couple things, but it can also mean, uh, one of them can mean a deceiver, right? And he was Esau's twin, and you know how he deceived their father to get the birthright, right? You know the story. And then Moses. Moses' name means to draw out. And we know that Pharaoh's daughter drew the baby Moses out of the Nile River, hence, and then named him Moses. So these are just a few examples, but there are so many, many more. And thirdly, it's not just during the biblical times that names were important. It's important for us now. It's important for us today. Parents, all of you guys who are parents, prayerfully and really, really consider carefully when they choose the names of their unborn child. When we have infant baptisms, is it not the norm that when the parents are up here sharing their testimony about why and why they um, are having their child baptized, they normally always include information about why and how they came to choose their kids' names, their babies' names, right? I have a friend from seminary, his name is John, and he had four kids while we were studying together. And he wanted all of his kids to have the word L in it. L means God. It's the Hebrew word for God. And so he had four kids, two sons, two daughters. Can you guess what names he gave them? Two boy names and two girl names. You guys probably aren't going to get the girl names, but the two boy names are going to be easy. What did you say? Yes, Samuel was the second born the son. Okay, Samuel's one of them. What was the first born son's name? I'm not hearing it. Michael? Did I hear Michael? <laughs> Nathaniel, someone said it. So first born son's name was Nathaniel, which means God has given. Second born son was Samuel, which means God has heard. The two daughters, I'm going to just give it to you. The third, so the third child, the daughter, was Ariel, which means Lion of God, and you would never have gotten the fourth one. The fourth daughter's name was, well, fourth child, but the second daughter, uh, her name was Catriel. Have you guys ever heard Catriel? K-A-T-R-I-E-L. It means God is my crown. So Nathaniel, Samuel, Ariel, and Catriel were the four uh, L children that he named. So let's look at our Old Testament text for today, Isaiah 9, 6 through 7. All right, for to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulder, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom. Amen. 
Now, I want to look at these verses that describe the various names um, for Jesus. This well-known passage from Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah, speaking about the coming Messiah. Again, blows our minds that the prophet Isaiah spoke this so many years before, right, it came to be, before Jesus was actually born. Starting from verse 2, not just verse 6 and 7, but actually starting from verse 2 to 7, this is often, the verses 2 through 7 was often called the royal psalm of thanksgiving. The royal psalm of thanksgiving. And believe it or not, it was sung at the coronation of a new king. Human kings. It was sung at the coronation of human uh, man kings, right? In verse 6, it says he will be called Wonderful Counselor. Wonderful. He's a wonder. It's He's a miracle of a counselor. His counsel goes above and beyond any human counsel or wisdom, right? He is one who is wise in ways of people, of human nature. He is one who will guide and comfort us like no other, that no human can. He is one who is able to be a shepherd to his people like no other. It also said that he will be called Mighty God, Mighty as much as he was wise, so he also has strength. Jesus has been, given, he has been given all authority under heaven and on earth. All authority and power has been given to Jesus. He is, in fact, God. You know, as I was preparing, researching, and thinking about this, you know, I grew up and always just, you know, you, you just accept. I grew up in the church. Um, you know, I listened to all the stories of Mary and Joseph and Bethlehem and the following the star. And you hear all this, right? And the birth of this baby from a woman, you know, from a real, you know, woman. He didn't just materialize, you know, boom, supernaturally or anything like that. To wrap our minds around the concept that Jesus was fully human, born of a human mother, a woman, but to be fully God, supernatural God, right? And I was just blown away because it's not often that you actually sit and contemplate that. And I remember even in seminary, like our professor would ask us questions like, on the first day of systematic theology, like, explain the Trinity. And we all look at each other like, oh my gosh, we're going to fail, we're going to fail, right? And then explain this, the incarnation, fully God and fully man. How does that happen? You know? And the thing is, the professor was just playing with us because he was saying, if you even attempt to write an answer there, then already you have failed. We have to be able to say sometimes in our minds, our human uh, wisdom, we can't wrap our minds around certain things such as this. So it, it is mind-blowing truly that he is, in fact, God. Also, he's called Everlasting Father, Everlasting Father, or Eternal Father. As God himself, we say Jesus' is Heavenly Father is God the Father. God is our Father. But Jesus being God himself, he is one with the Father. Again, the Trinity comes into play. How is one and three and three and one? You know, all these mysteries. God himself, he is one with the Father from everlasting to everlasting through eternity. So if you know Jesus, then you know God. You know the Father. Fourthly, he is called the Prince of Peace. As a king, he commands, and he preserves the peace. He is our peace, and it is his rule and reign over the earth that will be one of peace. It's like that bumper sticker. Have you guys ever seen this bumper sticker? I didn't read that last part. Have you guys seen this bumper sticker? No Jesus, no peace, no Jesus, no peace. Such a good play um, on words there, right? Well, I want to look at Matthew chapter 1, verses 20, and, um, verses 20 and 21 as well in the New Testament. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. 
She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. Now, Jesus is the Greek form of the word Joshua. And we know that Joshua um, means the Lord saves. That's the meaning. Again, we talked about names and what they mean, the Lord saves. This was a very popular name, actually, because many parents wanted their son to be named after the great leader who conquered Canaan, after Moses, right? And some parents, I was, it was very interesting for me to um, find out this fact. Some parents even named their son Joshua, hoping that he would be the Messiah. I don't know, but if, if I knew that my child was going to have to live that life, maybe they didn't think that far ahead, right? Um, but some parents even named their son Joshua, hoping that he would be the Messiah, the promised deliverer, the promised hero for their people, because their people were in persecution and were being oppressed. And so I guess, you know, they want their child to be like a hero and this great deliverer. And we know from Acts chapter 4, verse 12, that salvation is found in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. There is only one. There is only one name under heaven by which we are saved that we can call upon. Continuing to the next uh, two verses, Matthew 1, 22 and 23, all this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet, that the virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. Here the New Testament is actually quoting Isaiah 7, verse 14. In Isaiah 7, 14, it says, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and will call him Emmanuel. So this was a direct quote in the New Testament in Matthew of this passage from Isaiah. Now, in the Gospels, you all know that famously, most of us have memorized, just like you all know, when you hear the words, in the beginning, right? You hear, you, you think of Genesis, right? Also, in New Testament, when you hear, in the beginning, you see this, or you think of this, hopefully, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, right? We think of this. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And he continues in verse 14. The Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. How incredible is that? How unfathomable is that to think that there is a God, but the God came, became flesh, and dwelled among us. Look at this quote. I don't know how many of you guys know history or have heard of this guy, James Irwin. He's an astronaut. He's the eighth person to have walked on the moon, I found out. Eighth person to walk on the moon. This is a quote that he says. There's something more important than man walking on the moon, and that is God walking on the moon. Wow, right? What, every time I read that, I'm like, there's something more important. Can you imagine if you were alive back then when the first person, human, was able to walk on the moon, you know, we we're going into space, spaceships, space shuttles, you know, I mean, just the, the, how amazing that was to think that humans were able to design such things that could fly into outer space and land on a moon, that's incredible to us, right, how big that must have been, he is one who did it, he is one that actually stood on the moon, and he says, there's something more important than man walking on the moon, and that is God walking on the earth. How amazing is that? Think for a moment of some great event, some big moment in your life. It could be something amazing. It could be a one-time experience, uh, some sort of exciting, um, something that happened. Whatever that moment was that you're thinking about, wasn't it that much greater? Didn't it make it that much more awesome because you were able to share it with someone important to you? Think about it. I don't know what you guys are thinking about. And if you didn't 
or couldn't share that moment, that experience, that, that event or whatever with someone, wouldn't it have meant a lot more if you could have? Think about things that have happened in your life that were huge, but you experienced it alone. And you're like, no one else saw that? Like, you're like, man, I wish so-and-so were here with me to see this. I wish so-and-so were here to, to have been able to do this with me, right? Things like that happen. For example, graduation from high school or college. Most of us have graduated from high school or college. Some of the youth still haven't. There's a difference between walking, right? You walk to get your diploma. There's a difference between walking at your graduation with family there and without any family there cheering for you. Huge difference. Or when you're getting married. There's a big difference between, you know, we want our parents and we want our family and friends to be with us and to share that moment of when we get married. This is the way that God created us. He made us this way, that we want others to be with us when celebrating these great moments of our lives, what the, you know, hallmark moments, you know, or like these big events or big things. We crave, it's not, it's not enough and it's almost not, you know, uh, you know, if, well, these days, it's not, it's not true or it's not real unless you take a picture of it and post it on social media somewhere or else it didn't happen if you don't have proof in that way. But back then, before all this, you know, cameras and cell phones and stuff, you know, it, you almost feel like it didn't happen unless someone was able to share it with you in some way and experience it with you in some way. As I said, this is how God created us. He made us in a way where we want to share it with others when we celebrate big moments. This is true not only for our great, big, and good moments, but unfortunately also for our bad moments. Think for a moment, such as during a sickness or illness, or after, during or after a death of a loved one. When you're grieving, when you're hurt, when you're in pain, when you're sick, you want somebody with you. You want someone to share the pain with. I remember growing up um, when I had a stomach ache during the night. You know, you guys get stomach aches during the night, right? Like deep, deep in the night, middle of the night. I remember that I would walk by my parents' bedroom door and cough. I'd walk by several times, coughing each time, hoping that my mom would hear and wake up, right? I never knocked on the bedroom door or woke her up directly because I felt bad knowing that she had to get up in the morning to go to work. She had to go to work like at 5 a.m. And so, you know, I knew, I didn't want to wake her. I felt really bad. But I really wanted her to know that I was sick and I needed her. And so I would walk by purposefully um, in front of my parents' bedroom and cough. It never, ever failed. She always woke up and came out. Always woke up. It's like moms know. My dad never woke up and came out, <laughs> just putting it out there. But my mom, it's like mothers have this radar, but my mom would always know. And, you know, I didn't have to do it more than maybe once or twice or at most three times. And she would come out to be with me. And it always made me feel better. And this was, I don't even, I'm not talking about even elementary school. This was like during high school and even like during college. I lived at home um, during my college days. But even then, so it doesn't even matter how old you are. Mamas, you know, just having them near you always makes you feel better. And our deepest desire as humans is to know that God is near, is to know that God is with us and that we are never alone in this world in what we go through. The question for most people, is not, is there a God? The question that most people ask is not, is there a God? The question I believe that most people ask is, is God truly with us? Not questioning that there is a God, but is that God truly with us? Throughout the Bible, God shows us that indeed he is faithful to the promises that he has given, even with Abraham, you all know, in Genesis 26, 3, God says, I will be with you, and I will bless you. And you know, God certainly blessed Abraham more than the stars in the sky, right, with descendants galore. 
Then later, Abraham's grandson, Jacob, doubted that God was with him. But you know what happened there? One night, Jacob had a dream. Jacob had a dream and, um, where God came to him, and God said to him in the dream, Jacob, I am with you, and I will be with you wherever you go. Genesis 28, 15. And when Jacob woke up from the dream, this is what he thought. First thing he says is, surely God is in this place, and I did not know it. And also after the death of Moses, great Moses, we know that God spoke to Joshua. And God says to Joshua, no one will be able to stand against you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Joshua 1.5. So, in one week, it'll be Christmas. We celebrate the birth of Jesus, the one who is called Emmanuel, God with us. And that's the message of Christmas. It's not that God will keep us and protect us from disappointments and the messes of our lives, but rather that God is with us during those times. And oftentimes, most of the time, that's enough. My mom's not a doctor, but when I'm feeling sick, simply her presence, even though you know how old I am, even now when I'm not feeling well, just thinking and having my mom near, her being with me is enough. Many of us operate on emotions and feelings. And so, you know, it's easy for us to say, God's not here because I don't feel him, right? We say, I don't feel him. God's not with me. Because we operate out of this, you know, feelings and emotions. Well, the truth is, let's see this slide. The truth is, Emmanuel, God with us. God with us. And that is the truth of Christmas. One of his wonderful names is Emmanuel, God with us. As the praise team comes up, I want to ask you to do something. I want to ask you to think over this past year. Think about this past year. We only have um, one week, two weeks left of this year. Think during 2022. Think about the ups and downs. Think about the highs and the lows. Think about your joys and your challenges. All that you've experienced, all that you've went through, the good stuff, the bad stuff. And I want you to say, you can say it out loud, you can say it in your mind, you can say it, but truly in your heart, that through it all, Emmanuel, God was with me. And as we look ahead to 2023, as we try to change things in our behavior, as we make New Year resolutions, as we try to be better in the new year, we look ahead with hope. And I want you from your heart to be able to say, Emmanuel, God will be with us. Amen? Amen. Let's all stand together.